unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I want us to have a very important conversation concerning what Christ has done regarding the sin offering, the trespass offering, and what that should do in the liberation of the believer from a guilt, conscience, and condemnation. One of the most dangerous spirits that are crept in unawares in the body of Christ and so often have seen among believers, even those who have walked with God for a long time, is the spirit of guilt and condemnation self-condemnation, self-guilt, but also sometimes that condemnation also passes over to individuals in the church and that guilt is imposed on individuals in the church and that's one of the most dangerous demon spirits working in the present church and today I came to deal with it in the mighty name of Jesus. What is guilt? Guilt is that consistent and constant remorse caused by a feeling of responsibility of some offense or some wrongdoing or some sin or some mishap. And so somebody is consistently feeling remorse and sorrow and it rides with self-condemnation. It goes with condemnation. Without condemnation, there's no guilt, of course. Condemnation precedes guilt, but those two are brother and sister. So somebody falls in a sin, makes a mistake, a brother, a sister, and the Lord, and, you know, they repent and say, you know, I'm sorry, God, I shouldn't have done that. But then they continue carrying a remorse and a guilt. They continue carrying that feeling of responsibility of that wrongdoing, but then it starts to prick them. And in the process of pricking them, it starts to disqualify them. It starts to separate them from God. It starts to stay between them and their relationship with God. Remember the Bible says sin disturbs relations. When a man is conscious of sin, past sin, that man cannot fully relate with God. You know, that man cannot effectively serve God. That man cannot walk in tandem with the way of the spirit because he has a guilt conscience and sometimes it's not on us as individuals like i said but sometimes we also pass that condemnation or guilt on individuals which have fallen in the body of christ and then we continue pointing fingers at them and then we twist it in and then we do whatever we have to do just to make sure that they are remorseful and they are feeling bad for themselves and they are consistently walking without offense before them. What this does and why this spirit is very dangerous is because no man can really hear God effectively with guilt and condemnation before them. No man can really walk with God fully with guilt and condemnation before them and Satan knows that. No man can walk in the liberty of the Spirit of Christ, in the freedom that we have received in God when they are carrying a guilt conscience. And so in the church, we say, how am I to walk guiltless? How am I to walk out of this condemnation? Yes, the scriptures exist, and I'm going to show you several of them, right? But this has become so dangerous, and God showed me many years ago that the reason why certain people will never hear me, the reason why certain people will never walk with me, or I will never fully be able to use them as I ought, it's not because of what they did, but it's because of the guilt that stayed in their conscience. It's because of the guilt that stayed 
in their heart. It's because of what the devil has consistently brought back to their souls for their past. And this has and will lead to their own destruction. In 2 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, prior earlier, we have had instances where Paul is condemning the church of Corinth. They had started to walk off. They have started to vie off, you know, their responsibility as believers. And in there, there was a fellow who was caught in incest and uh, it was a big deal. And these fellows had not dealt with this guy to restore him. And so Paul sends a message to them that we shall come in the judgment of that fellow. That's, I think, earlier in First Corinthians. So he alludes to those experiences when the people of God had not walked into repentance of the sin that was a miss. And in the eighth verse, he says, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, he says, Though I made you sorry with a letter, in other words, I guilt tripped you, I do not repent, though I did repent. And I want you to underline that. I do not repent, present, though I did repent. That means when Paul was hard on them later, he did repent before God because the Spirit of the Lord told him, much as you are holding these guys at ransom for whatever has been done amidst them, there's a way you're not supposed to rub it in so much. Right? But by the grace of God, somehow this worked out for good. And now in present time, he's not repentant because of the result it produced. But he then did repent because he saw the difference between godly sorrow and ungodly sorrow. And that's what I want to show us. He continues to say, For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. It was not supposed to be eternally. Okay, it were but for a season. Even the intention of the man of God speaking condemnation or guilt tripping the church then was not supposed to be an experience of forever pointing fingers at the church of Corinth. But he says, even this which I sent to a deal, he says, it was for a season. It was not meant to last forever. And he continues, he says, now I rejoice, not that you were meant sorry, I don't rejoice in that, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. You were repentant after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. And align damage by us in nothing, meaning that if we, by condemning you, by guilt tripping you, in any way, by the grace of God, you were not led to a sorrow of godly repentance, then we would have damaged you. So it's actually possible to damage a person you are rebuking. It's possible to damage someone that you are trying to restore. It's possible to damage somebody that you are trying to align. So he says, the beauty with this is that it ended into reconciliation between you and God. And so by us, you did not have a damage. That means there was a possibility of us damaging you to a place where we disconnect you from God. But by the grace of God, you were repented uh, of the God's sort. In the 10th verse now, he puts the hammer home. He says, For godly sorrow worketh to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented, see, of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. That means there's a sorrow that is to be repented of. And that's why I want to emphasize my teaching tonight. He emphasizes it in the 11th verse. says, For behold, this self same thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it rowed in you, number one. What clearing of yourselves, number two. What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what revenge. And revenge that was against sin, all right? In all things have you proved yourself to be clear in this matter, or for all things have you proved yourselves to be guiltless in this matter. Now, I'm emphasizing this. Not every guilt leads to repentance. In fact, in the New Testament, God looks more to the conviction of a believer than the placing of guilt a condemnation of a believer. Why? Because guilt and condemnation look to your past. Conviction looks to your future. Guilt and condemnation are to the flesh or the soul. Conviction is to the spirit. And the inner man, that man which is born of God, is of a different nature from the man without. In fact, it is with the strength of that inner man by the spirit that we wage war with the man without. 
You see that? So if that man within is killed through ignorance or false doctrine, it means that you start to die within to without. But when the man inside is strengthened by the speaking of truth, it means that that which is within you will start to manifest without you. And so your soul and your body will be aligned to the will of God concerning your life. Let's go back to the conversation of the other fellow. Guy committed incest. And Paul says, which is not even common with the heathen. Even the heathen don't do that. He speaks of something that went beyond. It's not even in the Gentiles. This fellow went and had his father's wife. It's an example of sin in the church. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I'm just giving you a typical example. This fellow went and had his father's wife. Wow. And Paul says, uh -uh, this is a fornication among you that is not even named among the Gentiles. Even folk who don't know God don't do that. So he says, and I'm coming. You guys might take this lightly, but it's a very, very grievous sin. And I'm going to come that we will judge that fellow or you fellows should judge that guy and make sure that everybody would learn not to walk that way. And so indeed he was judged heavily. But as the way of the Spirit would have it, in 2 Corinthians, and I want to emphasize that, 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, from the fifth verse, if we'll read in the Amplified Version, he says, but if someone, the one among you who have committed incest, has caused all this grief and pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it to you severely, he has distressed all of you. See? And he says, for such a one, this censure by the majority which he has received is sufficient punishment. You've censored him and that all these things, condemned him, isolated him, discriminated him. And Paul says, it's enough. It is sufficient. And he continues to say, so instead of further rebuke, underline that, instead of further rebuke now, you should rather turn and graciously forgive and comfort and encourage him to keep him from being overwhelmed by excessive sorrow and despair. Again, you see that sorrow? You should comfort him. You should encourage him. You should forgive him and keep him from being overwhelmed by the excessive sorrow and despair. I therefore beg you, he said, not only to do that, but to reinstate him. Reinstate him. Put him back to his original place in your affections and assure him of your love for him. He says, for this was my purpose in writing to you, to test your attitude and see if you would stand the test, whether you are obedient and altogether agreeable to following my orders in everything. I know the fellow has messed up. But if he continues in this sorrow and despair, he's going to go into a wildly sorrow and despair. And that wildly sorrow and despair can only lead to death. He's either going to fall back into the world and destroy himself more, or he can even commit suicide. You see? Because that's what wildly sorrow does. It has no hope beyond the man's weakness. It has no hope beyond the man's wrong. It has no hope beyond the man's fall. It has no answer. You see? The world says once a sinner, or is a sinner. The world says once a thief, or is a thief. The world says once a prostitute, or is a prostitute. Or is a prostitute. You see, the world is not forgiving. It is not understanding. It ain't seek that reconciliation. But he says, now, if we lose that fellow, his blood is going to count it on you. So he says, look, go back, encourage that fellow, comfort him because he's repentant. Go back, encourage him, comfort him, forgive him. And above all, reinstate him into his original place of your affections and assure him of your love for him. And this I did to test whether you'd be obedient in everything. Why? Because something in the church then had come in, and I see it again in the church in 2020, where when a man or a woman falls off and then we brand them something, we label them something, we want them to rot and die. We never want to do or have anything to do with them because they made a mistake. Now, some of the mistakes were even banishing people out of church are not equal to incest in the time, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5th chapter. 
but he's giving us an extreme experience. So that mean that we are complacent concerning sin, that we have a laxity attitude to them which for all know sin is wrong. And for us to know the price and power of sin, it had to take God to come in the flesh to shed his blood at Calvary for the remission of our sins. So it's a serious thing, but he's saying, but it's through this that sometimes we emphasize the power of sin even beyond Christ's salvation and forgiveness that we continue to emphasize the sin of an individual beyond God's grace and mercy. And that's to destruction. That's as the world deals. A story is given where a young lady lived a very promiscuous life since she was little. And um, in the account that I heard, she goes into a particular church later on, gets born again and is changed and transformed. And one of those days, she asks to give a testimony before the church inspired by God that through this, somebody will be changed and transformed because she wanted to reveal the changing power of God. And so she stands before the church and testifies, oh, I was raped at the young age, 12, and then I started becoming sexually active from that age, and I was a prostitute for many years, and I sold my body to hundreds and hundreds of men, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that, but God found me on that street as a prostitute, and and by his saving power, I was redeemed and changed and transformed. I'm the new creation. And I thank God that even the diseases that I thought would be in this body never came. I did not contract any STDs and stuff like that. I'm here to testify of what God did for me because I thought that I was a dead woman. Church clapped, testified and thanked God for the goodness. A couple of years later, a few years later, again in the same church, the pastor is a man of God. He has a son. Uh, one of his first sons, he's uh, the one he has trained to take over the church when the man of God goes to heaven. So this boy has been raised in church, a good boy, mama's boy, God's boy, daddy's boy, uncle's boy, auntie's boy, everybody's boy, the good one, the holy one, who doesn't even know how to tell a lie. So they've prepared him since he was a child to take over the responsibility of the church. He's the example. He's the one every sinner looks at and feels guilty, see? And so, the Lord comes to this young man in a vision and tells him, you know what, I got you a wife. And in a vision, he shows him this young woman which had testified one or two years before of a life of prostitution and sexual perversion and all these things. And so he receives it. And then he goes to his father and mother and says, you know what, dad, I think I've seen the person that I'm supposed to marry. Who? we're excited, yay. And who's the person? That particular lady. Who? Which one? The one who testified of her life of prostitution? Yeah, that's the one. The father is like, uh-uh. No. Mother, no. Why? Yeah, 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 yeah. We thank God, by the way. But you, you know, she's born again. and But we cannot let you marry her because she has a history. What if in her past life, somebody kept a video, a picture, they bring it together. Uh, when you're married to her, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if she's not really changed? Yeah, yeah. What if something's still in her heart? You know, the soul ties in history and probably she connected many demons. We don't know how many are still with her and how many are not. So they go to and fro and stuff like that. You know, they go to the elders and, you know, it became a big war. So one of those days, they see the young man as insistent. So one of those days, they sit through before a council. All the pastors of the church, the elders are there. The parents are there. The young girl is not in the meeting. And so they're speaking to the son, we have told you to stop this relationship with this young woman that you have insisted. And you know, many of the church members, even the pastors are agreeable. The girl has a history. How will you carry this history? And so they said one old man in the meeting, which was an elder stood up and he says before them that ladies and gentlemen, men and women of God, I've seen that the debate has been between this young man marrying that young woman. But he says, but if you lift your eyes from what you see by the flesh, the real debate is, and question in the room is, is the blood of Jesus Christ sufficient for the remission of our sins? And is it indeed true, like we preach it before people, that when he forgives our sins, he throws them to the ends of the earth and he remembers them no more? Is it really sufficient to make the vilest sinner clean? That is the question in this room. 
not whether this young man is going to marry this young woman because we don't know how many marriages have taken place. You can go back through history and see men like Hosea, they married a prostitute. The many people have married all kinds of people, but the question, what's disturbing you is, has your conscience come to the recognition, the full understanding that actually the blood of Christ washes it all away and that woman before God is as spotless as new. And so the story is that the people that were in that room were pricked and they fell to their knees and wept and repented because they had disqualified the testimony of Christ because of a woman's weakness and the righteousness in their son. And that's how the world is. So in the church, unfortunately, we have not yet seen that transformation to see people, men and women, as a new creation and behold the old is past and now the new. Now Paul says, even if that individual has done it in this new dispensation and they're born again, you condemn the sin, that's right. Restore them all you want, but at the end of the day, the restoration must reinstate them to your affection. It must encourage them. It must comfort them. It must forgive them and deal with them as though they never see it. But that's not what religion teaches. Recently, I heard a story of a man of God who fell somewhere in a certain religious group. And they were quick to distance themselves from him to denounce him, to judge him, to condemn him, to, you know, demonize him before the world, the fallen world. Because of that sin, he buried their dead. He was at their funerals. He officiated the joining of some into holy matrimony. He was with the sick in hospitals. He one souls for the kingdom he loved the unlovable they came to him for repentance when they fell some came to him for restoration when they fell they could not tell anybody and this is the fellow they can come to and say you know what my brother pray for me i am a lasting for this woman and i'm doing all these kinds of things and he kept all their secrets some of them and now because of that sin there's a possibility that he might never stand on their altar again. He might never preach to them again. He will never be a man of God to them again, that they are walking in the light. Listen, you walk in the light according to truth, not according to self-righteousness, but according to truth, according to truth. For all have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. But they're being justified freely through the redemption which is in Christ. We're not saying that sin is bad or anything. But how many of his kind have fallen and have not been exposed? Or how many even of them which have criticized him have lusted in their heart? Have seen the same sin in their heart? Did they take themselves over to the media? No. But that's just how the world is. It's just how people see God. I've given us an example in Corinthians. The Amplified says you should rather turn and graciously, with grace, comfort. With grace, forgive. With grace, encourage. With grace, that he might not be excessively overwhelmed with that sorrow and despair. Because if he dies, you are responsible. If anything of his life fails, you're responsible. When David killed Uriah and took over Bathsheba, it did not mean that God stopped using David that day. He stayed a man after God's own heart. The Bible is full of men which were imperfect in the flesh, but mightily used by God. The treasure is in earthen vessels, that the excellence of power might be of God, not of us. The sufficiency is of Him. We are all a work in progress. See? And that is why we preach grace. And that is why we are going to be persecuted. Because we're preaching the truth. And that's okay. Because I'd rather be on the side with God alone 
than be on the side of multitudes. I would rather be with God alone. You see what I'm saying? In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 26th verse, when he's speaking about the relationship between a man and the wife, Christ and the church, in the 26th verse, he speaks of how the intention of that love that Christ has to the church is that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. And he says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, having no spot or wrinkle or any such things that it should be holy and without blemish. Who is holy without blame, without spot or wrinkle in the flesh? Who? Tell me who you know in the world is without spot or wrinkle. Tell me in the world who you know has not sinned in the flesh for a year, for two days, except probably for those in a coma. But any living individual, our thoughts sometimes go places they're not supposed to go. Our speech sometimes says things it's not supposed to speak. Our ways in life sometimes go the way we're not supposed to go. Because we are in the flesh, this flesh is fallen. Nothing is in the glory of redeeming this flesh except the man of the spirit. And that man of the spirit, the Bible says, is incorruptible. He says in Peter, being born not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. That which is incorruptible. But remember, he said he has cleansed it with that which is incorruptible. <laughs> not that which is corruptible, but with that which is incorruptible. That he might present it to himself without blemish, without spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing, that it should walk the church in holiness. And that is the expression of Christ's love to the church. So tell me again, are you sure that by the time Jesus Christ comes back, the majority of the Christian in the world will be holy, without blame, without any spot or wrinkle in their flesh? Is that possible? It's not possible. The flesh is an enmity to the spirit, even to the most saved man in the world. And the spirit is an enmity to the flesh. So without spot or wrinkle is not really the state of the flesh. It is the state of the man of the spirit that has been renewed in understanding concerning what God has done through Christ. For example, when we teach about righteousness imputed through faith, it means that you're not righteous because of what you've done today or yesterday, but you are righteous because of your faith toward God in Jesus Christ, who gave himself as the propitiation of your sin. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the 10th verse, he says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Who is that? Jesus Christ. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief, who is that? Jesus, when thou shalt make his soul an offering to sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. When he speaks about how the Christ is going to become an offering of sin, when you read the Hebrew word there for an offering of sin, the word there is a shaum. And a shaum is the very word used in Leviticus, the fifth chapter, the sixth chapter, the seventh chapter concerning the trespass offering, which is the guilt offering. Guilt offering. Because not only is a man to seek, you know, repentance before God, but also God does not want this man to walk with guilt after that repentance. You see that? He's not supposed to walk with guilt after that repentance. Because guilt will kill him. And God is not a God who guilt trips individuals. That's not your God. Because once repentance is there, you see, the word repentance is metanoia. It's the changing of the mind. I was going this direction and I've turned. The moment you've turned, God doesn't even remember the direction you are going with. He has even no record of the direction you are going with him. So when he speaks of that seed, making the soul of the Christ an offering for sin, he's talking about him not only carrying our guilt, Okay? But a shaw means he becomes our guilt. Hallelujah, glory to God. He becomes our guilt. He becomes our guilt. So every time you look at Jesus Christ, you remember that he is my guilt. Every time you remember what he did at the cross, you refuse to be tripped into guilt 
because of your weakness. That's what a shall means. That's what it means. So yes, we are against sin and we do not believe in sin. When a man falls or they've done a mistake, yeah, we know that it's wrong. It's not godly. And we will rebuke them. We will do whatever we have to do in restoring and whatever takes place. But what we cannot do is to put them in a place to feel that they are less than us. Listen, a man is not less than you because he fell in sin. Because you have sinned too. You just don't know it. Because you are so self-righteous. You think that your righteousness is the righteousness of God. You assume that because in your own way and this dimension you have seen yourself walk a certain way and that means that God sees you that way. He does not see you that way. God sees the new creation through the work of Christ and not its own abilities. That is, if you're just talking about us just living a righteous life, even the heathen can. But that doesn't mean that that will justify them from eternal sin. No. That only can be done through the blood of the one which knew no sin. Human history has and will only record one man who knew no sin. That is Jesus. You're not going to be the second. You'll never be the third. You see that? In the flesh. In the flesh. That is why it makes him the ultimate sacrifice, the propitiation, the perfect one of our sins. And he says, not only for us, but for the world. Not only for us, but for the world. So why am I speaking this way? Because you see, again, like I said, if we do not teach these things the way they're supposed to be understood, we are going to lose many people because of their sin, because they failed. We're going to lose them. And yet the work of God seeks to reconcile man and to God. In fact, Paul says we have obtained the ministry of reconciliation. So when you write or say something about a believer who has fallen, yes, you have told the world about how he fell. You've told the world about how he repented, but you've not told the world how he's going to be restored. You've not told the world that there is a grace in Jesus Christ that not only can restore, but instead that man and before God, he's as perfect as one which never did it. But that's hard for religion to say. Why? Because again, you're going to bring in self-righteousness and not the righteousness with which God imputes through faith. And so we refuse to be hypocrites in the body of Jesus Christ. We refuse to appear as though we are the only one which have not seen. Sometimes when I see people pointing fingers, I wonder, but haven't you fallen too? Haven't you made mistakes too? Haven't you erred too? Yes, you have. But God has still anointed you, sir. What if we had not discovered the man's witness. He was still standing on that altar and moving in the anointing and glory. You see that? Because God still has his grace and calling on his life. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He's still anointed by God. Even the worst sinner, a believer who has fallen into sin, the anointing of God is still upon him. He can still lay hands on the lame man and they walk. Why? If God has not taken it away, why would you take it away? You see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that I don't respect the order of, you know, the fallen and restoration. We do that even as a ministry. Somebody falls, I get him on site, tell him, you know what, this is wrong. We're going to sit you up for a few weeks and, you know, help you understand how to walk truly. But when we do, we don't leave them there. We make sure that they are reinstated. That's important. We make sure that they are reinstated. Why? Because if we lose them, guilt, again, like I said, kills a relationship with God and man. The guilt offering is for the restitution of a man back to his God. It's the restitution of a man back to his fellow man whom he has wronged. To say, you know what? Yes, this is wrong. It's not supposed to be so. But we need that reconciliation. We need that restitution. We need that forgiveness. And come back again in the place of our love for you. You come back in the place of our comfort for you. You come back in the place of our understanding for you. And the respect that even in spite of all that you have done, you're still a man or a woman of God. And God still has plans to use you. He still has plans to use you. Some people don't know that when Jesus came for the Father, he went on the side of the sin. He did not come to deal with righteous men. Uh -uh. The Bible says he came to save the ungodly. He did not come for the righteous. 
them which assumed they were righteous. No, the Bible says Jesus came for the ungodly. So God is on the side of the sinner. Why? Because he separates the sinner from their sin. He does. Now, as hard as this might be, even for those who are so theologically upright, but without the revelation of God's love, it still stands eternal that one day when we stand before God, and this is an amazing thing, that one day when all these things we're talking about will not matter. The end of our communication before God will be the faith unfeigned with which we had with God. And God said, once you understand this, you go to the end of all commandment because you're perfected in that love because faith worketh through love. I hope you understood that. Faith worketh through love. Because today we have a faith that is faint. It is deceived and deceiving. And so we are taking away the power of God that is effectual in not only the healing or restoration of the fallen, but the strengthening of them to walk a life that is free of sin. Free of sin. So you have two men. One is a Pharisee. He says, I thank God because I tithe. My coming and meat, I fast, I do this and I do that and I do that and I do that and I do that. And then there's another man saying, you know what, God, give me your mercy. I know that without you, I am nothing. I know that I can never walk right except by your grace. And God justifies this man who goes to him for mercy. Why? Because this man understands that without God is nothing. For again, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Why is it that sometimes when we're condemning people, we give the impression that we are better than them? We're not any better. Brother, you're not any better. You're not any better. And before you know that, one day God sometimes, and I've seen this over time, I've seen God expose individuals. Expose them deliberately. Say, you know what? You thought you were good. Let me actually prove that you too have issues. He does that. So he says, if any of you is overtaken by fault, let you who are spiritual, he says, restore such a one in the spirit, not a spirit, in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you be tempted. If you read it in the Amplified, he says, brethren, if a person is overtaken in misconduct or sin or any sort. He says, you who are spiritual, who are responsive and controlled by the Spirit, he says, should set him right and restore and reinstate him. Again, I underline that. Reinstate him without any sense of superiority and with all gentleness, keeping an attentive eye to yourself, lest you should be tempted also. So some of you are actually dealing with a very sin you castigated and accused of another many years ago. And God is trying to tell you, look, I'm trying to show you that it could hit you too. It could hit you too. If you're spiritual, the first thing you do in the fall of a believer is your gentility. That, not our. The spirit of meekness should be clear. Your intention to restore should be clear. Your intention of reinstating that individual should be clear. Why? Because they are repentant. They're repentant. We only say, you know, we'll excommunicate you, denounce you if you're unrepentant. But if you are repentant, and again, we treat you that way, that's not the way of the Spirit. So, not only should we forgive, and I see that some of you still have fingers pointed on individuals without looking at yourself considering yourself, keeping an attentive eye on yourself. Or we also have individuals who have judged themselves so much, are carrying guilt every day and condemnation for themselves that they have failed to hear God. They have failed to relate with God. They don't find a confidence in their service toward God. I came to speak to you, for now there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus for the law of the life-giving spirit Spirit in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. If you live according to that flesh and guilt conscience, you shall surely die. But if you by the Spirit kill the transactions of the body, you shall live. Father, we thank you. Before the throne, no, God above. I have a strong and 
perfectly a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives in peace for me whoever lives in peace for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can beat me that deeper no tongue can beat me that deeper when satan when satan tempts me to despair and tells me all the guilt with me upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sins who made an end to all my sins because the sinless Savior died Perfect, faultless, righteousness, the great and tangible I am, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory and of grace. When with Himself cannot die. Savior and my Lord, my Savior and come on, let's come it. Oh, 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 I speak to the spirit of guilt and condemnation that it shall have no power over you in the mighty name of Jesus and I also rebuke that thing which works in the sons of men to point fingers and condemn men guilty for years and forever to write them off and never see them again as ministers and believers and children loved by God I decree and I declare that we are free and that restitution that reconciliation draws us closer to you and to our fellow man. May love abound in all these things. And may we know that love which passes all understanding, that we might be filled with the very fullness of God. We would understand the weight, the breadth, the height. We want to see and understand that love of God fully, for which we will never be separated. He said, where the things present I'm persuaded, he said, were the things to come. 
no angels or principalities, no demons. He says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which he has showed in Christ Jesus. So you are free in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for them which are sick right now of all manner of sickness. Receive healing or send healing for them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your Lord and Savior. You just say this word. Say, Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ, whom you sent for the remission of my sins. And today, I receive him as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.